Well, here we are again. The world hangs by a thread. So, waiting on edge to see if Vladimir Putin will invade Ukraine. I have sounded off of my view on this matter. I think the West is provoking the situation dramatically. Maybe spurred on by the president of Ukraine, who maybe made it a campaign issue. I don't know of this whole joining NATO, but the whole thing, I don't understand why the West, like, I actually, I think I do. I think they say, well, Ukraine is a sovereign country. It should be able to do whatever it wants. But, I mean, putting a military alliance like NATO on the doorstep of Russia, to say that's not provocative to me is disingenuous. You may feel otherwise. To me, that is a provocation. And what's interesting is I think this provocation puts Vladimir Putin in a beautiful situation. He may want Ukraine, but he probably thought it was too outlandish to try something like that. So he goes for Crimea. But now he's being given a reason. At least that's how I see it. And then if the West backs off, he's also seen as a winner. So the West, in my view, has brought this upon itself. And my suspicion is actually the West is trying to dial it back. And I think that's very wise if they are, if they insist on not budging even a tiny bit on this, then I think we're headed for trouble. And what do I know? But just from my opinion, I don't think they want to go to war and take over Ukraine, but they will and see a lot of benefit in it. You know, so I don't think you can just put NATO on the doorstep of Russia. There's a huge border. And you know what's crazy about this, and then we'll get on to mining matters, but this affects our markets. But what's crazy about this is you look at a map, look up Ukraine on Google Maps. You know, if you look at Ukraine on Google Maps, then were Ukraine to fall to Russia, you see Belarus, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, they just look visually like the logical next step. And before you know it, here you are, former Soviet Union starts to reform itself. I think this is so outlandish that I don't think Putin ever dreamt he would actually be doing this. What do I know? But that's my suspicion. But if he's going to be provoked like this by having Ukraine join NATO, I don't think he'll really think twice if he knows for sure that the West isn't going to budge on that. I think they are budging because I think Europe understands this situation a little bit better than, say, the Wall Street Journal editorial board, which is complaining about Germany not sending weapons to Ukraine. You know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of the Iraq war, where everybody talked themselves into a trance that somehow attacking Iraq was a good idea. It totally reminds me of that. And it's like, have we learned nothing? Completely different circumstances. But on an unconscious level, it's very similar. It's people using reason to try and justify irrational things. And then they tell themselves whatever story they need to in order to get that irrational aim, to reach that irrational goal. And it's just, have we learned nothing? So anyway, 10-year bond breaks 2%. I believe that was off the inflation numbers last week, which continued to be high. If memory serves, it was like 7.5%. So inflation remains an issue without question, and the 10-year bond has been showing it, and so it has been moving higher. It took a break at around 1.8, then it started moving again above 2%. Gold is at $1,850, and that is down $20. So gold was all the way up at 1870, probably on these Russia-Ukraine tensions, and generally, that is how gold acts. Like the day of something bad happening, you will see gold make a move. So also interesting. Markets remain just kind of choppy. Although, you know, as I look at this, Dow futures up 424. And this is based on this idea that Russia is returning some troops to its bases. So my take on this is that Europe is starting to tell, I think, everybody actually is probably telling Ukraine, you know what, this guy's a former comedian. The president of Ukraine is a former comedian. 
And he's out there making statements that he has to dial back as being sarcastic when he says the invasion will take place on Wednesday. And then he's dialing that back and saying, oh, that was just a sarcastic. So you have a, I think people are starting to realize that this guy is a bit of a provocateur. And no, we don't want Russia to tell Ukraine what to do, but we can't let this former comedian talk us into a military confrontation with Russia. That's what I suspect is going on, you know, just my two cents here from the Northern Miner podcast. Coming up, we have an awesome show. We have Michael Jones, who used to be at Platinum Group Metals. He reached out to me before Christmas and I said, yeah, let's have an update because it was a super interesting interview. Now he's at Los Andes Copper and it's really interesting what he is trying to do. He's basically been given this kind of great project and now he's got to spread the story, scale the story, so to speak. And so after asking him a little bit about the project, I really kind of dialed down on what do you do to scale a project as far as the story is concerned? How do you spread the story of a mining project? Because I think almost every mining company, except for maybe the very biggest ones, that is one of their biggest challenges. So hopefully this will be helpful from a guy who spent decades in the industry. I think he said 30 years. We have a global mining symposium coming up and this is on February 23rd and 24th. So we are talking next week. So registration is open. Just go to events.northernminer.com. So that is happening. And also we have commodity prices, which continue to rise. We have tin above $20. All of industrial metals are higher. So also interesting. So uh, just another day at the office here. And with that... If you want to find us online, you can find us at northernminer.com. You can find us on Twitter at Northern Miner. Find us on Instagram at The Northern Miner and on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, where we also host these podcasts and wherever podcasts are available, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, and Stitcher. And with that, let's turn to our CEO spotlight with Laura Zizzo from Manifest Climate, a super interesting discussion on how companies can comply with current ESG requirements in a very financial way, not just on a greenwashing webpage. How do you comply? And she's your person. So with that, let's turn to Laura Zizzo of Manifest Climate. Joining me today on our CEO Spotlight, I'm happy to welcome Manifest Climate co-founder and CEO Laura Zizzo to the podcast. Laura, welcome to our CEO Spotlight. Thanks. Happy to be here. Well, it's great to have you. I mean, you're in such a topical area with ESG, really dominating the narrative, I would say, at this point in uh, every mining conference you go to for the last three or four years. It's kind of like the essential discussion. So you are with Manifest Climate. Tell us, what are you doing? Yeah, I'm glad to hear you say that it's finally got it, getting the attention it needs. Um, I've been working in the climate change and environmental space my whole career. I actually started the first law firm focused on climate change back in 2009. Done a lot of work with the, the mining sector, and it's led us to create Manifest Climate now as a software as a service for organizations trying to understand, manage, and disclose climate-related risk and opportunity. We understand a lot of people are coming to this issue thinking, oh, geez, what do I do? The mining sector is actually in a really great position because it's been thinking about environmental issues and its impact on communities in a focused way than many sectors. So there's a real opportunity to, to get ahead of the investor concern about climate risk and opportunity and make sure you're telling a robust story that's aligned with the climate realities we have now. Yeah, I think that's such an interesting point you bring up. Everybody knows, you know, they have to do something. If you're a mining CEO, you know you have to do something. You need an answer on these things at the minimum. And actually, you need more than an answer now. You need more than that one-page website, the greenwashing you know, website. So tell me, how do people actually start taking practical action if you're a you know, small mining company or large? Like, what do you propose? What, how can you help us? Yeah, absolutely. What we understand is that we are going through a climate transformation now. There's two macro trends, right? This decarbonization that's happening, 
we are going to be net zero by mid-century if we're going to you know, keep up with what the science demands. And we need to adapt to the impacts of climate change. So the mining sector has both of those mega trends it needs to think about. How are we going to be part of decarbonization? And how are we going to make sure we can continue to operate in a climate that is rapidly changing? So, you know, we think about northern mines relying on ice roads. Thinking about the application of a change in the weather patterns if you don't have those ice roads. You have to think about that from a business risk and opportunity perspective. So we ask our clients to think about this as a core business issue. And that's not just us, it's what investors are demanding as well. So how do you think about not what your sustainability team is doing? It's not about sustainability anymore. It's about viability and integrating that into your whole business practice. So we help people understand the task force on climate related financial disclosures recommendations, which are now being mandated. They're going to be required here in Canada. They're already required in the UK. They're going to be required in Australia, Singapore, Hong Kong. So over 85% of the global GDP, any stocks that are being traded, you are going to have to have alignment with the TCFD. We help you understand that and understand how you can better communicate and level up your understanding of those climate risks and opportunities to make both the business strategy stronger, but also the story to the external stakeholders more robust. Interesting. So you help companies, in a sense, fulfill the current needs, really, of the market, one could argue. And and so is this consulting? Like, wh- how does this work? In real yeah. terms, you know, like, what are you doing? Do you have a meeting with people? Uh, <laughs> wh- how does this go? It started as consulting. And then I realized when our consulting firm was growing so fast, I said, it's the same questions over and over again. This is a software play. So we actually are a software firm. We are supported by climate experts and consulting, but we've developed best in class, a benchmark. We use AI and machine learning to help understand what you're already disclosing and how that aligns with the TCFD requirements and how you can do better. We also provide market intelligence. We help you understand what your peers are doing. So we're really data driven and using the power of technology to get more information into the hands of our clients. So we have an onboarding process. We ask you a bunch of questions. We help you understand where you currently are and how you can do better. And if I could say there's three main areas that we really want the mining sector in particular to understand and think about. So identifying what assets are most at risk from the physical climate change we're seeing. So this increased extreme weather events. Thinking about how your business is impacted by decarbonization. So it's not just your own greenhouse gas emissions. Of course, that's important. The mining sector has a huge opportunity. What does the electrification of transportation mean for your business? Where are the minerals going to come from for all of this? So understanding the strategic demand that's coming from the decarbonization trends and how the mining sector can respond and telling a story about how you're part of that solution. And then thirdly, it's your own operational emissions. So thinking about scope one, two, and three emissions that your business has. So you can say, we're in this for the long haul. We understand we need to decarbonize. We're part of the solution going forward. Companies that can do that, especially in the mining sector, they'll be better off in the capital markets for sure. Absolutely. As I was almost saying before, like at the very minimum, you need a story on what you're doing environmentally today. And in fact, you know, you could argue it's just not enough anymore to have a story. So you help craft that story and you also help actually sounds like with uh, practical solutions that people can implement in order to do that. Now, as far as the kind of clients you have, like, is this, you know, for the people who are listening, is this for all sizes of companies from mega corporation, like Barrick Gold, all the way to your sort of, you know, explorer in the Yukon? Yes, of course. We we built this thinking, oh, large issuers. So those big public companies are going to need the help. But we realized actually the market is much broader than that. And our solution is actually targeted for those smaller companies that might not be able to have an expensive consultant come in and do the work that they probably need. So we're trying to take that big, you know, consulting brains that we had and make it into something that's more accessible for all those organizations. So even pre-IPO companies are coming to us to help them understand how do we get ready for the IPO, knowing that the requirements around TCFD are there. So we have a broad range of clients in the mining sector as well, from smaller exploratory companies that really just want to get it right from the beginning to the largest mining companies in the world. Yeah, I could totally see there being that just direct need for that, especially, I mean, some of these companies are like two people, right? So 
do they want to hire a third person for ESG alone, or would they rather, you know, sign up to a software? So this is a software. It's an online software as a service. I assume then the cost scales out for, you know, if you're a smaller company, you're not going to be paying the same amount as uh, a large corporation. Is that yeah, fair? That's right. Yep. Yeah. Our sales team is happy to chat about specific pricing based on your organization's needs, but it does. it's a sliding scale based on how many modules you want access to. So in addition to our TCFD module, we also have market intelligence and a learning module. So you can scale up or down there. And then we do have a scale of pricing based on size of company because we know there's a lot more impact for those larger companies. They have a higher subscription rate, obviously, than the smaller companies. We just want to help empower this transparency into the capital markets. So we know we want to make it accessible for all. That's great. And and for those people who maybe are considering this, how long have you been in business? And, and like, is there a lot of demand? Are your clients mostly in Canada or is it global? Or tell us the nature of just the people who are signing up to this. Yeah, as I said, I started a law firm back in 2009, just focused on climate change. So this is the evolution of that business. In 2015, we started Manifest Climate as a consulting firm. Two years ago, we really transitioned that into uh, the SaaS product. So our product's been out in market for about a year now. We have mining sector clients already on it. We have a lot of financial institution clients on it as well. But we're really excited because we're backed by some really great venture capital funds that see the importance of this and want to see us scale quickly. So we're already scaling in the UK and the US, Australia. We have some clients there. Scandinavia. So we're happy to take you wherever you are. And we think that this TCFD, the global standard, is the same no matter what jurisdiction you're in. You need to be able to understand, manage, and communicate your climate-related risks and opportunities. Interesting. And just lastly on this TCFD, so could you just explain what that is a little bit more and why mm -hmm. that's important? Like, what is TCFD? I've never yeah. heard this term before. The Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure. So in 2015, gotcha. it was launched actually by Michael Bloomberg and Mark Carney when Mark Carney was the head of the Financial Stability Board in the UK. And he said, we have a problem here. Financial markets are not properly understanding or pricing this massive economic risk that's related to climate change. If we're going to actually decarbonize and deal with these risks, we need everyone talking the same way about it. So they put out these recommendations. There's 11 recommendations for disclosure to be inputted into financial disclosures. This is not a sustainability report thing. This is how do you integrate it into your financial disclosures around the governance, your strategy, your risk management approach, and what metrics and targets you're thinking about. So those are the four pillars of the TCFD. There's 11 recommendations under those four pillars. What Manifest Climate does is really break down those recommendations and help you understand how do I respond to those recommendations? Think about what I'm actually doing aligned with those recommendations and better talk about it to our investors and our other stakeholders. And just a final follow up on that. So if you don't consider this, would it be fair to say your financials are incomplete? Correct. So right now there's already this sort of common law understanding that it's required because investors are asking the questions. But to kind of make sure that everyone's doing it, the regulators are asking. So I mentioned that it's coming in Canada. We have a regulatory proposal from the Canadian Securities Administrators that's going to require all companies to align with the TCFD. It's already on the books in the UK. If you're listed in the UK, you are already required this year to disclose. If you're listed in New Zealand, Australia, Hong Kong, Singapore, same thing. So it's coming fast and furious on all organizations. There's a requirement to think about TCFD. There's some phase in, it's not right away, but we're here to help you understand what that means for you and the jurisdictions you're operating in and how you can think about better disclosing aligned with what's required. That is fascinating. Well, Laura Zizzo, co-founder and CEO of Manifest Climate, thank you for joining us on the Northern Miner podcast for our CEO spotlight. And if people want to find this online, I guess they go to manifestclimate.com. That's correct. We got that one. Manifestclimate.com. Please come and see us. We're really happy to show you around and, and get you a demo. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thanks so much. And thank you once again to Manifest Climate for sponsoring this week's CEO Spotlight and turning to the website. They're back. Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos-backed firm gets cash injection to find battery metals. Well, I don't think it should be too hard for a Gates and Bezos-backed firm to get a cash injection. Let's take a closer look. Cecilia Jamesmi 
Cobalt Metals, a startup backed by a coalition of billionaires, including Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos, has raised $192.5 million in its latest financing round, which will allow it to speed up efforts to find new deposits of critical metals needed for batteries and clean energy. It's a sizable amount of money raised. Investors in the Series B funding round for the company include Sam Altman's Apollo Projects and Mary Meeker's Bond Capital, as well as BHP and the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, Canada's largest pension fund, two people familiar with the matter, told the Wall Street Journal. Previous backers include big names such as venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz and Breakthrough Energy Ventures. Man, Andreessen Horowitz is everywhere in the VC world. The Silicon Valley-based firm, referring to Cobalt Metals, founded in November 2018, plans to use artificial intelligence to create a, quote, Google Maps, end quote, of the Earth's crust, with a special focus on finding cobalt deposits, you know, this could be very good for Canada. It collects and analyzes multiple streams of data from old drilling results to satellite imagery to better understand where new deposits might be found. Algorithms applied to the data collected determine the geological patterns that indicate a potential deposit of lithium and cobalt, which occurs naturally alongside nickel and copper. Scrolling down a bit, Cobold, as its chief executive officer, Kurt House, has stated many times, does not intend to be a mine operator, quote, ever. Yeah, as I like to say, they want you to do the dirty work. They don't want to get their hands dirty with this mining business. They just want to, I guess, provide some sort of data. The company's quest for battery metals began last year in Canada after it acquired rights to an area of 1,000 square kilometers in northern Quebec, just south of Glencore's Raglan Nickel Mine. The firm, named after the German word for a goblin that controls the Earth's minerals, has already gathered publicly available data from company disclosures and government sources, as well as historical information from companies it partners with. I wonder if they've asked the Northern Miner about that. We have archives that go back to 1915. Some of the people they've asked is BHP, the world's number one miner, Norway's state-backed energy company Equinor, and Greenland Focus Junior, Blue Jay Mining. Kobold's algorithms then crunch the data obtained in search of geological patterns, which guides its activities and land acquisitions. So you can read all about that on northernminer.com, but uh, they are coming for you, as I like to say. Another story, a new training program aims to tackle labor shortage, break barriers in mining sector, so... Of course, following up on our interview with Eric Buckland last week on the mining jobs market, I thought we should tackle this. Naimal Karim is the writer, and it says here, in a bid to tackle labor shortages in the mining industry, an educational institute in northern Ontario is starting a training program that will aim to attract young people, women, and newcomers to Canada to the sector. The 14-week program at Collège Boreal called Mining Potential, will launch at its campuses in Sudbury and Timmins on February 16th. I guess that's tomorrow. And the goal is to expose students to the mining industry and prepare them for entry-level jobs. It will include lectures from executives and experts in the industry, site visits, information on health and safety, and the basic reporting standards required in the industry. The Canadian mining industry is experiencing a labor shortage, industry experts say. Job vacancy rates in the mining, quarrying, and oil and gas sector in the third quarter of last year reached a record high of 4.3%, representing more than 8,600 open positions, according to Statistics Canada. So again, I'll let you read more about that on the Northern Miner website. Moving on, Cameco plans restart of MacArthur River Mine and Key Lake Mill this year is by Alicia Hyatt, who is editor-in-chief of the Canadian Mining Journal. Cameco is restarting its MacArthur River Mine and Key Lake Mill in Saskatchewan this year making a slow easing of the company's supply discipline as the uranium market continues to improve. The assets, 70% owned and operated by Cameco, have been in care and maintenance since mid-2018. By 2024, MacArthur River and Key Lake are planned to reach 60% of capacity, producing 15 million pounds of uranium annually. At the same time, production from Cameco's 50% owned Cigar Lake Mine in Saskatchewan will be reduced to 13.5 million pounds per year, which is 25% below capacity. And we have a quote, extending the mine life at Cigar Lake by aligning production with the market opportunities and our contract portfolio is consistent with our tier one strategy and is expected to allow more time to evaluate the feasibility of extending the mine life beyond the current reserve base while continuing to supply ore to Orano's McLean Lake Mill. 
The company said in its fourth quarter filings, quote, This will remain our production plan until we see further improvements in the uranium market and contracting progress, once again demonstrating that we are a responsible supplier of uranium fuel. So that was a lot of words here. It kind of sounds like they're strategically deciding to reduce output from Cigar Lake and to increase output from MacArthur River and Key Lake. So they probably just have, you know, strategic reasons for that, one would think. So they continue to just, you know, fiddle around with production there at Cameco. It is part of their strategy. And for all we know, it may be working as uranium prices have risen. And moving on, a couple of stories in BC, BC regulators clamping down on a couple of projects. So let's take a look quickly. Skeena loses Albino Lake due to, quote, incomprehensible, end quote, decision by BC Gold Commissioner. It's by Marilyn Scales. Skeena Resources has responded to a decision by British Columbia's Chief Gold Commissioner on the tailings in the Albino Lake storage facility at the past-producing SK Creek Gold Silver Project and BC's Golden Triangle. In August, Richard Mills an individual holding a mineral claim on the lands that underlie the albino lake material, applied to the commissioner for a determination as to the ownership of the minerals in the tailings. The albino lake storage facility is a subaqueous deposition of metals, sulfides, and certain deleterious elements for the past producing mine. The facility is managed by Skeena under the terms of the province's Land Act Surface Lease and Authorization under the Mines Act and Environmental Management Act. The company believes the decision is in error. So it looks like <laughs> this is your worst nightmare, isn't it? Someone comes up out of the blue with some kind of claim that they own the mineral rights under a lake that you're working on. Quote, it is incomprehensible to us that the chief gold commissioner of British Columbia would transfer ownership of materials that Skeena and prior to that Barrick have actively managed and environmentally monitored for decades in the Albino Lake storage facility to an individual who staked barren mineral claims below the facility, said Skeena's CEO, Walter Coles Jr. We feel this sets a grave precedent for mineral exploration, development, and environmental liability management in British Columbia. Skeena will utilize all legal avenues to remedy this situation within the BC court system, and we have already begun the appeal process. What a mess. So that happens, and then we had this other story BC rejects permit for Morrison Copper Gold Mine again, and this is by Cecilia Jamesmi. The Canadian province of British Columbia, I think we can remove Canadian province. Cecilia is one of my favorite writers for years here, but we can remove Canadian province of British, we can just say British Columbia, or the government of British Columbia, has once again denied an environmental permit for the proposed Morrison Copper Gold Mine on a First Nations territory citing potential risks to water quality and the local wild sockeye salmon population. The BC government also said the potential long-term effects and liability for the province were unacceptable. The open pit mine is on the territory of the Lake Babine Nation and upstream of the Gitanyao and Gintekasen First Nations land. It was expected to produce 30,000 tons of mineralized material per day over its 21-year life. 30,000 tons a day, wow and has been stuck in the environmental assessment stage for 18 years since 2003. And scrolling down a bit, the province's decision follows a BC Supreme Court ruling in 2013 requiring the project to be reconsidered and a government's order in 2015 to submit it to further assessment. So you can read more about that, but a couple of moves in BC. And finally, just a headline here, because we are running short on time, lithium spot prices soar in Lunar New Year. And so lithium prices are rising. And just a quick quote in here, this is by Henry Lazenby. Several major lithium producers in China put their facilities on maintenance before the New Year holiday. They resumed production this week, but didn't reach full capacity until now. So spot lithium units have been tight. And this is a Chinese lithium producer who told Fast Markets that. And just one more quote from another Chinese lithium producer, quote, Amid the scarcity of spot lithium units, we received a lot of inquiries for battery-grade lithium carbonate in the first week after Chinese New Year, and many customers have urgent needs, but we are sold out, so some shortages in the lithium market. So you can read that story also on northernminer.com. Those are your news stories. Now let's take a look at metal prices.
And turning to metal prices, we'd like to thank our friends at mining.com slash markets for providing us with these prices each and every week. And on February 15th, gold is trading at $1,854.33 per ounce. That is $35 higher than last week. Silver is trading at $23.38 per ounce. That is 47 cents higher than last week. Platinum is trading at $1,020.58 per ounce. That is $9 higher than last week. And palladium is trading at $2,295.09 per ounce. That is $88 higher than last week. And turning to our industrial metals, copper is trading at $4.55 per pound. That is $0.07 cents higher than last week. Aluminum is trading at $1.45 per pound. That is $0.05 cents higher. And I do believe that is a two-year high in aluminum. Lead is trading at $1.04 per pound. That is three cents higher than last week. And nickel is trading at $10.75 per pound, just below our high from a month ago at $10.89 per pound. And tin has broken $20 at $20.05 per pound. That is 38 cents higher than last week. And also a two-year high in tin. Cobalt is unchanged at $31.96 per pound. And zinc is at $1.67 per pound. That is two cents higher than last week. Not quite breaking our two-year highs at $1.72, but very near at $1.67. So zooming out, I would say, you know, if I had to read the tea leaves, I would say precious metals up on geopolitical tensions, particularly gold, while commodity prices continue to move higher maybe on the inflation print, probably heavy investor demand following that 7.5% number. But either way, industrial metals continue to hover and move higher at their current highs. And those are your metal prices. And coming up, my interview with Los Andes Copper CEO, R. Michael Jones, and we discuss politics in Latin America. What's the reality over there? Is How challenging is it to actually build a mining company over there? We also talk about copper. We talk about his previous work at Platinum Group Metals. And we also discuss, perhaps most importantly and interestingly, in the last half, about how to get your story out there as a mining company. It was very interesting. So I hope you enjoy this interview, and I will see you on the other side. Joining me today, I'm happy to welcome back Michael Jones, President and CEO of Los Andes Copper. Michael, welcome back to the Northern Miner Podcast. Thanks for having me on. Well, it's good to have you on. It was a very interesting discussion we had last show where you were sort of singing the praises of all things platinum. You're at Platinum Group Metals, and now you're at Los Andes Copper so I guess why the switch, first of all? Are you still bullish on platinum? Or tell us about the switch and just the transition to the new company. Yeah, well, as you might know, I was at Platinum Group Metals for 20 years. I actually founded the company and made a major discovery in the Waterberg deposit there, which I'm very proud of. And I decided to make a change after being there for 20 years and took some time off, actually. And I was contacted by Warren Gilman, who's a fund manager in Hong Kong, who I've known for many, many years. And he said, listen, you know, I know you normally work on companies that you found and start from the beginning, but this is an extraordinary opportunity of a world-class asset that's not known by the capital markets. So I went and did a bunch of work. I got into the data room. You know, I'm a geological engineer by background. I did a lot of due diligence and found that, yes, indeed, this is a tier one copper asset. And that I phoned a couple of fund managers and brokers and nobody had ever heard of the thing. So uh, it was definitely unknown as well which seemed like a fabulous opportunity. And so uh, unusual for me, uh, I came on as a, as a hired CEO. Interesting. So were you saying you stopped then at Platinum Group Metals and then took a break yeah, and I, then you started I, at Los Andes Copper? Yeah, I resigned and I was off for uh, about three months, I guess. I took a break and mm -hmm. Warren contacted me during that break. I was actually planning to take quite a bit more time off, to be honest, but this was just such an extraordinary opportunity. Uh, you know, that's what I decided to do. And what happened at Platinum Group Metals? I mean, it sounded, when we last talked, it sounded quite bullish. And there was that technology you were telling me about that also sounded pretty amazing. 
or is it platinum or palladium? I think it was platinum Most, that mostly your palladium focus was. And mostly palladium in mostly the deposit palladium. that uh, Platinum Group Metals has. And certainly, yeah, the technology involving batteries uh, was very interesting. Copper, of course, though, is involved directly in electrification of everything. And for me, at this time, I thought that this was, uh, you know, a great opportunity to go into copper at the right time. I mean, you see the declines of of the interest in uh, all kinds of fossil fuel moving forward. And, you know, the, the copper is plugged right into the whole new different economy. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that. I had uh, Jeffrey Christian on the program about maybe three or four weeks ago. And I was asking him if he basically equated, you know, the PGM metals more with oil and gas based vehicles, engines. And almost I was asking him if there's a correlation where, you know, platinum group metals might do better when EVs and Tesla is doing badly on the charts and vice versa. When EVs and Tesla are doing well, platinum group metals goes down. So to your point, I guess copper is definitely considered one of these green metals, one of these exciting metals that will help make this green transition. Whereas I wonder if PGMs are sort of being seen as more part of that kind of oil-based economy. I don't know, you're, you're right in the heart of both those metals. What do you think about that? Um, well, certainly palladium uh, is tied to autocatalysis. I mean, it's the majority use um, in the conventional um, engine. I think it'll be around for a long time. But, you know, new applications for palladium, I think, should be on the forefront of the PGM industry's thought process because of the of the trends towards uh, these changes. So, you know, if I was still in the PGM industry, I would be very busy with things like, you know, batteries and other applications of, of PGMs as a catalyst. But, you know, for copper, it's very straightforward. And it's interesting, people don't you know, think about the they think about the EVs and the batteries and they talk about nickel and cobalt and lithium and so on. They forget sometimes about the copper windings that are actually in all the electric motors that make it go. And then on the sustainable side, interestingly, you know, when you plug into a power plant, you get a gigawatt of power from a huge power plant. It's one connection. If you want to go to the sustainable or renewables market, you're going to end up to a whole bunch of different sources and those all have to be wired together. And then you go to the other end of the transmission line and you have to distribute it to charging stations, which is another whole distribution network, transformers mm -hmm. and everything. So, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in the calculations that, that people I don't think really have made. I haven't been able to find it anyway, is that, you know, for a gallon of gasoline distributed in a city, how many pounds of copper does it take to sustainably make that? amount of energy and distribute it. That would be a very interesting equation. Unfortunately, I'm busy running Los Andes Copper and I can't do that work myself. But if I was out there as an analyst, that would be a very interesting equation. You know, I've never heard about that or thought about that idea of distribution. And it sounds like it's pretty important and that copper would play a pretty important role in this idea of distribution. I, I really like that example you were sharing. So then let's talk about what you're working on. So you're in Chile with Los Andes Copper. You were brought on, how long ago was it? So I came on at the end of October. Um, I studied the company uh, for about a, a little over a month, um, but I came on at the end of October as, as CEO. Okay, excellent. And you were saying you think there's a tier one deposit. I mean, this term gets thrown around a sure. lot, but tell me, so what are you working on? What's the project? Sure. So the Vista Cheetahs project is a 1.2 billion ton resource. It contains 13 billion pounds of copper equivalent. In the initial PEA study, it can produce 150,000 tons of copper a year, and it has a 45-year mine life. So those are a whole bunch of factors that when you say tier one, is it really? So, you know, the first factor is scale. The second factor is, you know, the grade and the amount of metal it can produce. And the third factor is the mine life that's involved. And this is a large copper ore body. And it's in a neighborhood, actually, with mines that surround it that are four and five times that size. And this is one of the really exciting reasons that I joined Los Andes Copper is because they're really, even though there's a billion ton resource there, they're really at the beginning of actually understanding this whole system. And there's there's a whole bunch of reasons for that, but it's early days. You know, in my previous discoveries, I've drilled something like 100,000 to 500,000 meters of drill core until mother nature told her secrets. 
in this particular case, they've only drilled 60,000 meters and they already have a billion ton deposit. So to me, that's very interesting. That is very interesting. And so what is around there? And is this a producing mine? Are yeah, you drilling? Is this where we are? We're, we're drilling right now. Um, it's It's got a PEA on it, so a preliminary economic assessment. The project mm -hmm. uh, generates about a 26% internal rate of return at 350 copper. Um, copper is, of course, at $4 or more. But because of the fragmented history of this land position, it took a decade to put this all together into one land package with one set of permits. And Los Andes has essentially been a private public company for many years. They focused on the technical aspects. They were financed largely in Chile, actually, privately. And it really just didn't have a public company profile. And as the whole thing got assembled, the major owners here made a decision that they were going to either go private or make a proper public company. And the first thing they did was bring on a mining team, then they improved the board, and then they went looking for a CEO, which is me. And so it gives me the opportunity to take all the good work that they've done and actually tell the capital markets about it. And, you know, that's that has um, brought some performance. I mean, since I've joined uh, the company, the stock price has doubled. So we're getting somewhere, but we're still a long way from the analyst targets uh, and what they're saying about fair value. So we've got lots of work to do in, in exposing this asset to the to the capital markets. Yeah, speaking of the stock price, I was looking at it before I logged on here, and the stock does seem to be doing very well. It seems to, uh, it's just kind of 45 degree angle up. So tell me about Chile then a little bit. So you're exploring, you're drilling, how is working there? I mean, we hear a lot about South America right now, Latin America, how it's getting a little more challenging than it was, even in these traditionally, you know, quote unquote, safe mining jurisdictions like Chile and Peru. Now it's there's maybe not quite the same certainty, at least from a narrative perspective, maybe from a real perspective, it's kind of the same. So that's what I'm asking you. You're on the ground there. Tell us, how is it working in Chile? Well, of course, uh, you know, a lot of people know that there's a new president just come on, relatively young fellow uh, from the left of the political spectrum. What's been impressive recently is in the appointment of his cabinet, he actually appointed a lot of very senior people, which were praised by both sides of the aisle, people with very good experience and, and have been involved in running the country previously. So that was a, that was a very welcome move. There will be an increase in royalty. We anticipate there are various proposals. There was a very draconian proposal that was thrown out out there uh, six months ago, but that's been uh, uh, toned back a lot in the rhetoric now. And, you know, one thing that people don't appreciate is the Senate in Chile actually moved to the right so that the, the balance of power in the Senate is actually 50-50. Uh, and that hasn't happened for quite a long time. So, you know, we do expect an increase in the royalty. We do expect tougher environmental standards going forward, as you see around the world. One of the great advantages of this project is, is that it's it's 120 kilometers from Santiago, which is a beautiful modern uh, city. You know, it's it's a 2000 meters elevation. So it's not one of these projects that's way up in the high Andes with a lot of challenges. But certainly Chile, 30 percent of the world's copper comes from Chile and 10 percent of Chile's GDP is copper. And another factor that people don't recognize is there's about, it's estimated something like $68 billion worth of capital that has to go in in the next three or four years into Chilean copper just to stay even. So, you know, there's a function here where if you increase the royalty too far, you actually discourage investment to the point where your revenue actually goes down instead of up. You know, one very good appointment uh, made in Chile was the the central bank governor was brought back to become the Minister of Finance. You know, that was seen as a very good move that will understand, you know, he will certainly understand these kind of equations. Very interesting. Yeah, I guess there is a huge difference oftentimes between the campaign trail rhetoric, as we call it. And once you're in, you kind of want the country to work. And when 10% of your GDP is copper, like you say, well, maybe you don't want to throw out all the copper companies or to increase the royalties too dramatically. How is it working with the locals then? I assume you're by some town or village. What's it like there? 
done Tell a lot of work that. in the local community. Um, we've supported various things in the local community and have an open door uh, policy, lots of dialogue. There's always people who are uh, you know, not interested in mining in every community. I don't think there's a mine in the world that doesn't have um, someone who, who uh, doesn't favor mining. But uh, you know, we've been able to uh, get our permits uh, and, and do our work. And uh, I, I think there's a, uh, there's a good dialogue there. And we'll work very hard to continue to improve that as the project develops. I mean, we're just at the drilling stage now. The larger work comes with the, with the mining permit post the definitive feasibility study. So it sounds like it's going OK. And as far as copper is concerned, does anybody ever reach out to you and say, hey, you have a copper mine, uh, we might need some of that copper, or does that not happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, actually, it's interesting. This this asset is, um, you know, well known in the hallways of the major companies around the world. This is not unknown. I mean, there are some quite senior institutional reports. I'm I'm based here in London, actually, uh, in England. You know, there's a lot of uh, very senior companies that are based in this part of the world, and some of the the research companies have pointed out that this is, you know, one of the top targets for mine development in the world in copper. So. We're kind of known in the hallways of the major mining companies, but we're not known in the capital markets and we're still a TSXV listed company. So, you know, part of my job is to bring those two universes together is to make the capital markets recognize where the project sits on a on a world basis. And as you point out, we've we've had some success at doing that. But, you know, the analyst targets are a long way above where we are today. Now, tell me about the roadmap then. So you have this great project and I assume, is there only one project? It sounds massive enough where maybe that's all you need, but I assume there's yeah, one this, project here, right? Yeah, this is the focus uh, of the company's business. Um, it's a massive land position, it's about 300 square kilometers. It's surrounded by everybody from Glencore to Anglo to Cadelco to Tech to Freeport MacMoran all the way around it. So it's right in the middle of copper country. There are a number of potential porphyry copper centers we haven't even got to yet. But the first one, you know, we're still just finding out the size of it. So this is more than enough for the, for the company. The program basically is to drill. We've done a lot of the engineering around a pre-feasibility study already. So plant design, metallurgy, tailings design, infrastructure, you know, roadways, all that sort of stuff. All, all that engineering has been well done by senior company people, actually, who have worked for us directly. Um, and that's at a PFS level. The thing that's going to change is the resource on the mine plan. So we're now able to drill. And for example, we just announced a 700 meter intersection of 0.5% copper equivalent. And that was stepping out from a 500 meter intercept that didn't have a drill hole beside it. So, you know, this is still in the big chunky stage of understanding this asset. And so we've announced that our pre-feasibility study is targeted for the end of the second quarter that could get pushed out if the mine keeps changing. So, you know, if, if the mine plan is dynamic, then you got to think about the, the the scale and the position of, you know, where the pit's going to sit and so on. So we're, we're busy with all of that right now and, you know, watching it extremely closely. We have four drill rigs on site. Uh, we'll go up to five drill rigs and just keep trying to find the dimensions of this thing. So as we zoom out and wrap up this interview, I'm just kind of curious, like, what is your main preoccupation then on this project? Is it basically, if I understand you, and correct me if I'm wrong or add where I miss, it's basically to drill this thing out, figure out kind of what's there in a real way, and then try and get that message out to, as you say, bridge these universes together and get that message out to the right people. And does that maybe mean, okay, maybe that's a takeover, maybe it's build your own mine, or do you have that figured out? And does my characterization sound about right, or do you have other preoccupations? <laughs> well, I have lots of preoccupations because there's all the dimensions of the company to build as well. You know, we have to lift our governance, we have to sure. work on our listing, we have to, uh, we're filing mm -hmm. an AIF for the first time. Um, you know, there's a bunch of things around going from a 300 million to a 500 million to beyond that company, which I've done, in, as you know, in my career many times before. So that work we're doing. But in terms of the, the macro position, um, the owners are very clear. 53% of the stock is owned by Turnbrook Mining, which is a private company based in Chile. And the vice chairman of the board is the head of Turnbrook uh, Mining. They have been very clear that we are not going to build this mine. This is a hmm. mid-sized to big company project. You know, it's it's $1.8 billion in capital. We're not going to do that. 
this is a, a an asset that belongs in a much bigger company, and that's the strategy of the owners. The the thing that has to happen is is we have to get somewhere so that the value equation works, and we're looking at uh, potential strategic advisors and other things to make sure that we get this value properly recognized. Okay, excellent. And final question. Uh- How do you get that message out? I mean, I guess you go on podcasts like this, you put out the news. Do you, I guess you go to conferences? Like, is that, is it that simple, you know, like, or is there something else that you do? Do you call up your friends in the mining industry and tell them about it? What do you do? Well, I think, um, you know, for this company, you know, this is a high quality institutionally ownable asset. The problem is the liquidity is not there to get major institutions into the stock. So we need to work with some people that are well connected in the market. And of course, I have a a good contract trap line myself after 30 years of doing this. And there's no easy way. I mean, it's just simply hammering away day after day, introducing the story to a new institutional contact. And, you know, we've been able to bring in some institutions for seed type positions and, uh, I very ungraciously have described this like starting an old motorcycle, you know, like you just keep kicking at it and kicking at it and eventually some smoke comes out and then eventually the thing starts to turn over and then eventually it goes. So that's kind of how I see developing liquidity and pricing on this story is, is that the, 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 the toughest part is actually just getting the first bit of it to turn over. Once it starts to sort of want to go, the asset itself is going to carry it. And um, we're in that kind of starting phase where you can see little fits and starts of liquidity, which is people taking positions who recognize the asset. And eventually that becomes a trading universe and off it goes. But, you know, quite frankly, liquidity is a function of not only interest. There's lots of interest around. There's also not a lot of selling. So, you know, you have to find a price point at which buyer and seller start mm. to naturally meet each other. And I, and I think we're still in that developing stage where we make all that happen. But it's like you say, this podcast and uh, 150 phone calls and, you know, just hammering away at it. There's there's no easy way. So then just a final follow up on that. So would it be fair then, because this is something and I'm just trying to learn what it's like to be in your shoes. Like, would it be fair then to say you're trying to raise money, raise capital? No. Is that a oh. No, actually, that's not it. I mean, we've we've got almost $5 million in cash. We're drilling. We have no debt. Uh, well, we have a convertible, but it's held by a, a, a very friendly shareholder who's on the board. Um, so there's no pressure here for funds whatsoever. So we're not after raising capital. What we're interesting, interested in is raising profile, liquidity, and getting the asset properly valued so that if we're going to have you know discussions with anybody, the share price is not something that they point to as a as a marker of value because you know the project's worth 2.7 billion dollars according to the independent engineers at an 8% discount rate you know the npv is 2.7 billion after tax right the stock's trading at 300 so when you're trading at 0.1 times nav you you have a problem <laughs> you have to fix that so that's part of what we're doing and the only way to do that is to focus on the business drive the business forward and just communicate consistently Okay, so maybe I was just misunderstanding liquidity, and then I will let you go. But to me, like as uh, someone who doesn't do this for a living, who is not a CEO, so does that mean, like to me, the obvious thing would, well, why aren't you trying to get on the TSX? Like, does that solve your problems at all or not? uh, So uh, when you do an annual information form, which I answered, or which which I talked about, all of that information can be populated into a TSX main board listing. That listing in itself is not going to particularly do a lot for you unless you use that as a platform to communicate off of and point people to it. You know, one of the things that senior institutions will do is say, well, it's a lower listing company. So, you know, either we don't do that or I don't look at those type of companies or whatever you get cast aside just by your listing characterization. Right. So, you know, do you want to take that away? And the company belongs, you know, on more senior exchanges, I believe, by its asset. But you have to apply and you have to go through the process. So, but this is all part of a, it's like, you know, walking. You just, you just walk this process forward. You don't, if you try and jump to there, it's not going to work. Like I've got a list of like 25 things I got to do. And we just march through them one after another. And I put them on a timeline. Okay, so it's. February 14th, Valentine's Day, I'm supposed to have this, this, and this done. And I don't have that one and I don't have this one, but those ones I got done. And you just march through it. 
the asset is already there. That's the beauty of this is that the value in the asset is there. It's just a matter of communicating it and, and growing the, the business along the way. Okay, excellent. Well, that helps a lot us understand what it's like. Uh, and so, yeah, and you've been in this role since October, so it's still fairly new. And as you say, so you just got to walk through it. Well, Michael Jones, happy Valentine's Day, and thank you for joining us on the Northern Miner Podcast. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Cheers. Well, I hope you had a very nice Valentine's Day as well. If you want to be our Valentine, simply leave us a review in the Apple Podcast directory, share it with your friends. And don't forget, we have the next Global Mining Symposium next week, February 23rd and 24th. Just go to events.northernminer.com to register. I hope you are having a wonderful week. And until next week, take care.